smallest of the four by far, and I'm going to try something I haven't attempted before, which is a 14 and a half minute ramble about com communicating the reality of war. Uh, I was a soldier once, not a posh soldier like Patrick. I was a private soldier, because you didn't have much choice in those days, and the first of life's many humbling experiences was when I failed what was called the WASB, the War Office Selection Board. And I failed it because I failed the intelligence test. And the, the, the presiding brigadier at Westbury was suspicious I could be quite so stupid, so he ordered me to take it again. Uh, and I failed it again. And I didn't mind until I saw the officers who passed. They were thick as two planks in those days. And the last thing you ever forget is your army number. Mine was Private 233398941. And it st stood me in marvellously good stead. You learn stuff called fieldcraft, which is how to stay alive in dangerous places. It stopped you as a war reporter asking stupid questions about what's the difference between a battalion and a, and, and a brigade. And, and, and it was the best education that I ever had. It was very bad for the army, but very good for me. And subsequently, I think I've worked in about 18 war zones, because I'm now an ambassador for UNICEF, and they send me where they can't send David Beckham or Robbie Williams, you know. <laughs> If it's Barbados, it's Robbie Williams. If it's Yemen or Somalia, it's me. Uh, and I've tried to communicate the reality of war, and it's been very frustrating, especially today, where we live in this celebrity culture, when people seem to be more interested in the outcome of Big Brother and, and Strictly Come Dancing than what really threatens us all over the world. And I speak as someone who turned down an invitation to appear on Strictly only last year. <laughs> so first of all, I tried it in television news. And the more I did it, the sparer my scripts became. I dropped the adjectives, I dropped the adverbs. And I remembered something that the former president of NBC News of America talked about, which is the art of writing silence, which is knowing when to shut up. And the other thing I understood is that you can't be neutral between... I was brought up in this dispassionate atmosphere of BBC journalism. On the one hand this, on the other hand that. Only time will tell. That's comprehensive rubbish and palaver, and there's an acronym for that. I didn't, and, and I invented in, 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 in my book, which I'm not promoting, but mentioning in passing. It's in harm's way. It's here somewhere. It was, it was written mostly on a typewriter with a broken carriage return. But some of it was written by hand by candlelight in my room in the Holiday Inn as the sniper's bullets were whipping past the window, and it's, and it's full of passion. And anybody can describe a far fight. But how did we get into this mess? Why didn't we stop it? Who's responsible for it? There's a whole section in the book I'm not promoting about the recognition of Croatia in December uh, 1991, which led inevitably to the war in Bosnia, as Lord Carrington, chairman of the Hague uh, c uh, uh, Conference, said it would. And, and, and we let it happen. And we, agl we allowed the recognition of Croatia under German pressure at exactly the same time when we were seeking uh, uh, concessions from the Germans about the opt-out clauses of the Maastricht Treaty. Now, work that out. And I've got chapter and verse of that in my book. And I felt angry and upset. But the thing about being angry and upset, it skews the judgment. So you, you, you write it very carefully. And I never wrote a book until I was uh, 54. And that one wrote itself. And I've written a few since. And they've been mostly war and peace books. And none of them are from from, from, from academia, they're all from, from life and experience and what people tell me, and I've been lucky to get on, on really well with the, with the soldiers. They're also informed by something rather extraordinary that happened to me. I just, uh, by accident, I became a member of parliament. And it was the four most shocking years of my life, including the war zones. So I've, I had to write about that as well. And I think what happened is that I, I felt I used to sit there on my little independent bench and I looked at the MPs opposite and the ministers and the junior ministers, this was the first Blair term, there was not a single one who had ever served in the armed forces or knew anything about the reality of warfare. Our army is going to be cut, the announcements made today after tomorrow by politicians who also know nothing of the reality of warfare. This is entirely new. Lord Carrington, who was a veteran of Normandy, told me that when he was Defence Secretary in the early 70s, every single member of Ted Heath's cabinet had been uh, in, 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 in uniform in the Second World War, with one exception, his education secretary, a certain Margaret Thatcher. And it was said of her she would have made an extremely effective and merciless machine gunner. <laughs> so what we've got instead is this inc incredible gap between the government and the government. 
between the politicians and the, and the people. So I started writing books, and in my old age, and I'm the oldest person here by a very long way, I suddenly turned to poetry because I felt so passionately about this. And last um, October, my very nice publisher, Icon, published a book of my dodgy poems. You know, you want to know about the banking scandal? I'll tell you. And if you're looking for rhyme for banker, it's easy to take a wrong turning. <laughs> I have no prejudice or rancor against the profiteering banker, but if he reckons that the owner should fall on us to pay his bonus, then I'm the Maharaja of Sri Lanka. <laughs> so then I turned to, to war and peace. I no more, know no more cat catastrophic decision by any government in my lifetime than the decision of Tony Blair's government to go to war in Iraq in 2003. So I, I wrote about it. I was about to give evidence to the war crimes tribunal in, in, in The Hague. And I, I sat there, and the, the defense were challenging my right to be there. So I was kicking my heels. And, and, and I wrote a, a long poem, the, the, really the centerpiece of this book of dodgy poems, uh, about the way he's, he, about Tony Blair before the court of history. It's a bit long, so I, I've only got 14 minutes. But I'll give you in memoriam. If you should wonder why we breathed our last, it was because of his sincere convictions. The flotsam tide of falsehoods floating past, the fantasies to which he clung so fast, the false prospectus hammered to the mast, the narrative as floor-flecked as the cast, and certainties that turned out to be fictions. The thing about my dodgy poems is that they're not obscure. You can understand them. Uh, Prime Minister Anthony Linton Blair, with messianic zeal and force of will, marched the Queen's soldiers up the hill, and then he left them there. Also, this is, it's, and I, I note, well, uh, Patrick will have seen this, when they're serving in Iraq, when they're serving in Afghanistan, the ministers come out and are pictured uh, in front of photo ops of the troops and tanks as if the heroism would, run, would rub off. I'm both pro-soldier and pro-peace. So this is called Brief Encounter. Somewhere remote and safe, out in the sticks, amid a photo op of troops and tanks, a politician walked along the ranks, expressing his condolences and thanks. A soldier threw some words into the mix. Sir, how much do you know of soldiering? Not much, he said. In fact, a harder thing. But what do you know of politics? Not much again, he looked him in the eyes. Except I'm rather good at telling lies. Um, you see, I think we've gone AWOL from our history. We British are now fighting our fourth Afghan war, with yet another three unnecessary casualties yesterday. Guess who won the other three? We didn't. Go to any of the Lion regiments, and I come from the 12th of Foot, the Suffolk Regiment, on all their battle honours, you'll see two names over and over again, Mesopotamia and Iraq, Iraq and, and Afghanistan. Where have we been in these last 10 years? Mesopotamia and Afghanistan. Um, I think we've got to get real. Um, and I find that poetry is actually wrong. Well, verse is a good way of expressing it. It's also... I take out my, 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 my thing about never making the office a class, you see. I wrote this last week. This is called the Suffolk Regiment, 1958. We were on active service in Cyprus. The regimental office and veranda were no place for the casual bystander, with beltless soldiers frog-marched in on charges of indiscipline, and corporals and other rankers busted and given two weeks jankers. The twelfth of foot on active service dealt harsh, harshly with the frail and nervous, except the officers, those precious beauties, whose only punishment was weekend duties. And I think we have to wise up to the costs of war. Uh, it is, war is not a policy option, whatever Tony Blair thought. War is the ultimate and most serious decision, going to war, the use of force that, that, that any government ever takes. And I think because we are governed by civilians, quite rightly, but civilians who accidentally have no experience of soldiering or warfare, they tend to believe that the use of armed force can deliver outcomes that it cannot. And I think this is one of the most serious problems that confronts us under governments of, of any complexion. Uh, the, the, the costs were brought home to me not long ago when I was a many young man at a wedding who had been in the, in, in the second rifles in Operation Panther's Claw in July 2009, exactly the same time as the MP's expenses scandal was breaking. And he got, took the precaution of getting married before the, his six-month tour of duty. And he's now left the service honorably. He did terrifically well. Uh, but he told me that of the eight men in the Guard of Honor at his wedding, four are now amputees. Now, just think of that. And I, there's a, it's one thing to stand up and salute their names in the House of Commons. It's another to be aware 
of what we are doing to, to our young men and women increasingly in uniform. I was at a Buckingham Palace garden party a month ago for a military charity and, I, I, and there were mostly old soldiers like me but there were a dozen young ones and most of them were double amputees. And I thought, what have we done to these people? And, and for what? And why? So I wrote this. The band plays and the medals glisten. The palace staff serve strawberry teas. Among the crowds who sit and listen are soldiers sharing memories and others quieter than these, the wheelchair amputees. These are our valiant sons and brothers who bore the losses without gains of our fourth war on Afghan plains. Don't ask who won the others. And as for those who sent them there, instead of falling on their swords, they reap their ill-deserved rewards. Honours attend them everywhere. They sit in grandeur in the Lords and they need no wheelchair. One more thing, then I'll, I'll surrender my little platform to people who write much more eloquently about soldiering than I do. I've just written for longer and I've lived it for a long time. Then at the end, I thought one of the great things about writing a book of dodgy poems is you can, you can write your own epitaph. Anybody can borrow this. It's not exclusive to me. I think I'm going to need it before any of you. It goes like this. When I'm gone, I hope you'll pause a minute and say sadly not to my face, the world's a slightly less worse place because of my time in it. But just as probably you may recall, I made no bloody difference at all. Thank you. Thank you.